thank you, Amy and Joe, for inviting me. Uh, let's hit the ground running. All right, this is called Matthew for Mormons. And I'm going to cover six topics. Uh, the first one is the authority of Jesus. The second one is kingdom growth. The third one is family and marriage. This fourth one is the building up to the cross. The fifth one is the temple. And the sixth, I guess that's five topics and a conclusion. Sorry, can't count. First one's the authority of Jesus. If you guys don't like, uh, if you guys don't like Jesus stories, you're going to have a bad time. At the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, quote, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had, what? Authority, and not as their scribes. After this, the Gospel of Matthew gives us two more chapters of examples of the authority of Jesus. It starts with the, the leper, the cleansing of the leper. When Jesus came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him, and behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. D.L. Turner writes, Jesus' willingness, not his touch, is all that is necessary for the healing, but the touch is probably the first human contact the leper has had throughout the duration of his illness. Jesus would have become ritually unclean throughout the uh, when, he when he touched, touches the leper, but the touch, instead of defiling Jesus, immediately cleanses the leper. Then it goes on to the faith of the centurion. This is cool. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, Capernaum, a centurion, a centurion is like a Roman officer, came forward to Jesus, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, Jesus said to him, I'll come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. But only say the word and my servant will be healed, for I too am a man of authority. I know how authority works. With soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and I say to my slave, do this, and they do it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I seen such faith. Later on he says to the centurion, go. Let it be done for you as you have believed, and the servant was healed at that very moment. Later, Jesus heals many. And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she rose and began to serve him. That evening they brought many to him who were oppressed by demons. And he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. A little later, Jesus calms a storm. And when Jesus got into the boat, his disciples followed him and behold, there arose a great storm on the sea. So the boat was being swamped by the waves, but Jesus was asleep. Sleeping like a baby. Probably had like a garment wrapped around his head. Just. <laughs> and they went and they woke him, saying, Save us, Lord! We're going to die! And Jesus said to them, Why are you so afraid? Oh, you of little faith. And then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea. Be quiet! And there was great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Later, or right after that. And when he came to the other side of the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him, coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, What do you have to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come to torment us before the appointed time? The demons are terrible. Now a herd of pigs was feeding at some distance from them, and the demons begged him, if you cast us out, send us into this herd of pigs. 
And he said to them, go. It's almost like, boo. <laughs> so they went out of the two men into the pigs. And the whole, can you imagine this whole herd of thousands, I think thousands of pigs, just the rumble of the ground. They rushed down into a steep bank into the sea and drowned into the waters. That's weird. The herdsmen fled. Just at the top, they ran into the city and they told everything, especially what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, the whole city came out to Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to leave the region. Chapter 9. And getting into the boat, Jesus crossed over and came to his own city. Good old Nazareth. Good old stomp, stomping grounds. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And then the scribes said, Excuse me? This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? What's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven. Or get up and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins, he looked at the paralytic and he said, you get up and you take your bed and you walk right on out. And he rose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid. And they glorified God who had given such authority to men. And as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew. Matthew's writing about himself, I guess, here. Sitting at a tax booth and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. A little later, a ruler came and knelt before Jesus saying, my daughter has just died, but come and just lay your hand on her and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. She said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. And Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And instantly she was made well. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead, but she's sleeping. And the crowd laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and he took her by the hand and the girl got up. And the report of this went throughout all the district. And as Jesus passed on from there, a little later here, next verse, two men, two blind men followed Jesus, crying aloud, have mercy on us, O son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came and Jesus said to them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Then they said to him, yes, Lord. When he touched their eyes, then he touched their eyes. According to your faith, be it done for you. And their eyes were opened. So here's some observations. There is no priestly ritualistic pattern to the examples of Jesus healing by touch. None. He touches a leper. He touches, uh, he doesn't touch this one, this one woman just touches the fringes of his garment. He touches the hand of Peter's mother-in-law. He took the sleeping girl by her hand. He touches the eyes of the blind. But Jesus does not actually need to touch to exercise his authority. He told the storm, be quiet. He told the demons, go. He told the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. And stand up, take up your bed, and go home. And he told Matthew, come follow me. And the Gentile, the Gentile centurion, he understood the true nature of Jesus' authority. All Jesus had to do was say the word. This is not about a method or a system of authority. This is about a 
person of authority. To give you a sense of how Jesus supersedes all systems and all structures of priestly authority, consider the beginning of Matthew chapter 12. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. They're probably more polite than that. I just like to caricature them. He said to them, Jesus said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry to, with, and, and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God, the the temple, or the tabernacle, and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him to eat, or for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Only the priests were allowed in the tabernacle, and David was not a priest. And have you not heard, have you not read in the law how, this, how on the Sabbath, the priests, these priests of Aaron who have the morning and evening duty to go in and service the candelabra, and the table of showbread, and the altar of incense. The priests enter the temple and profane the Sabbath and are guiltless. I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So this is the flow of Jesus' logic. If exceptions were made for King David, how much more appropriate is it for exceptions to be made for Jesus and his companions? Also, and this is what Craig Keener writes, if the temple service warrants suspension of the Sabbath, how much more the presence of the one who is greater than the temple? Get it? Jesus, or sorry, the temple is greater than the Sabbath. And Jesus is greater than the temple. Therefore, Jesus is greater than the Sabbath. That's the logic. Move along, Pharisees. The boss of the temple's here. And he's also the boss of the Sabbath. So for the chief priests and the elders and others like the Pharisees, the words and the works of Jesus Christ, mm, not enough evidence for them of the authority of Jesus, they demanded more. So you get all the way out to chapter 21, verse 23. And when Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests, that's important, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you that authority? Jesus answered them, oh, I'll ask you a question. And if you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John. Where did it come from? From heaven or from man? And they discussed it amongst themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, then he'll say to us, Why didn't you believe him? If we say from man, uh, we're afraid of the crowd. And they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. <laughs> and Jesus said to them, then I won't tell you by what authority I do these things. Observation. Jesus is talking to the chief priests. If Jesus' question about the baptism of John the, da John the Baptist, if that could be settled by asserting John's birthright to the Aaronic priesthood, that's a weird question. There's something else going on here. In fact, let's go all the way back to chapter 3, where John baptizes Jesus. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. But John would have prevented him. I need to be baptized by you. And would you baptize, would, and would you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let's, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And when Jesus was baptized, he immediately went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he, saw, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, mm, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So question for you guys. What did Jesus mean by 
fulfill all righteousness. I've got an essay online where I deal with this more at length, but here's a summary. Four reasons, or four things about the fulfillment of all righteousness. One, Jesus was identifying with the true remnant of Israel. There's, all, this is, there's a ton more I wish I could say about this. Two, Jesus was endorsing John's ministry of repentance. And three, Jesus was illustrating humility. I mean, this is a baptism of repentance. A lot of scholars say the baptism of John was a, lot, a proselyte uh, baptism where Gentiles who wanted to jo join the Jewish faith had to do this. It's a whole bodily cleansing. So, this is humiliating. Jesus is being humble. Four, this is most evident to me, Jesus is fulfilling a set of Old Testament patterns. Now to understand what I mean by this, you just read Matthew 1 and 2. The preceding chapters and the, and the, past, the chapter right after the baptism of Jesus. The king is born of a virgin. Smells like Isaiah, right? God's son was called out of Egypt. You know what I'm talking about? If you don't, just go read it when you get home. A wicked ruler kills the children. <laughs> Smells like the Old Testament again, doesn't it? A voice cries out in the wilderness. And immediately after the baptism, God's son fasts in the desert for how long? Forty days and 40 nights. <laughs> Smell more like the book of Numbers, maybe? Jesus is unfolding a set of patterns and predictions that smell like the Old Testament. We'll come back to this topic of authority at the very end. Kingdom growth. At the beginning of chapter 13, Jesus gives a foundational parable about the mixed individual responses that come to the preaching of the kingdom. It's the parable of the sower. You guys have heard of this? The seed is the word or the message. And the soils are the different kinds of people who listen to the message and respond accordingly. Following this parable, some lesser known parables, Jesus gives us other parables about the enduring spread of the kingdom. The parable of the weeds. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while his men were sleeping, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat while his, uh, and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also, and the servants of the master of the house came to him and said, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Do you want us to go and gather him up? But he said, Nah, lest in gathering up the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let's let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weed first weeds first and bind them up in bundles to be burned and gather the wheat into my barn. We'll come back to that in a second. Jesus gives two other parables, real short, the mustard seed parable and the parable of the leaven. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all seeds. But when it has grown larger than all the garden plants, it becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it all leavened. These parables have always been weird to me, but we'll come back, it's really cool. Jesus then later explains the parable of the weeds, going back. He left, he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, uh, Could you explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field? Jesus answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as, as the kind of angels that don't look cute, probably. 
Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. We'll come back. Three chapters later, Peter confesses Jesus as Messiah, as Christ. And Jesus assures him, I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Observations. In the parable of the sower, the seed is the word, and the enduring growth in each individual depends on the soil. In the parable of the weeds, the seed is people, and the enduring growth of the seed depends on the one who planted it, the son of man, Jesus, or the devil. Jesus assures that from the initial planting until the end of the age, both kinds of seeds will coexist. Only at the harvest, at, at the end of the age, will they be separated. Until then, listen carefully, my friends. Until then, the kingdom durably grows and survives by God's design. In the parable of the mustard seed, in the parable of the leaven, the kingdom sm starts embarrassingly small, but unstoppably spreads with an unbroken flow and grows surprisingly large and spreads widely. You guys know what I'm talking about here. If any man would boast of doing a better job than Jesus of keeping the church together, or, of, or boast of a kingdom that more sustainably grows. Or if any man would mock the church for being small or for coexisting with hypocrites or having controversies and difficulties and confusions and divisions, be reminded Jesus promised that his kingdom started and would grow until the end. It may be, the kingdom of God in the church might be hard to identify at times, like it was for John the Baptist. Remember that? He, he, was, he sent messengers to Jesus and said, are you really the one who's supposed to come? He needed to be reassured. The kingdom of God, the church might seem minuscule at times, but someday it will provide massive shade to the nations. It will not be uprooted or begun anew before the final gathering. The kingdom of God and the church will not need a restart before the final harvest. It may seem wounded, but it will never die. In Jesus' promise to Peter, it is Jesus who assures the building and the perseverance of the church. It is Jesus who assures the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It is Jesus who will do the building. It is Jesus who, do, who will do the sustaining. Chapters later, Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word won't. Family and marriage. Next, let us consider the topic of family and marriage. As Jesus sends his apostles out in Matthew 10, he immediately warns them of the persecution to come. And he tells them that, they, don't be afraid. God values you more than the sparrows, but understand this is gonna bring massive division. Verse 34 in chapter 10. Don't think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against a mother-in-law. I know you guys have experienced this. And a, and a person's enemies will, come, will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. 
Later in chapter 12, Jesus tells us who his real mother is and who his real brothers are. While he was still speaking to the people, verse 46, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak with him. Would you tell Jesus to come outside? We want to talk with him. But he replied to the man who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching his hand out, looking toward the disciples, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. In chapter 19, Jesus answers a question about divorce, really relevant here. Verse 1, when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, and great crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him. Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? I don't know what accent that is. It's the Pharisee accent. <laughs> he answered, Have you, haven't you read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are, not, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send them away? And he said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I tell you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if that's the case uh, of a man and his wife, it's probably better not to get married. What did Jesus respond with? He said to them, not everyone can accept this, receive this saying, but only to those whom, to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. Probably some figurative stuff going on there too. Let the one who is able to receive this receive it. Craig Keener, scholar, writes, most people look, this is tremendously relevant in a thousand different ways for today not just for Utah, but for the world. Most people looked down on eunuchs for their impotence, or how do you say this, effemininity, <laughs> effemininity, and recognized that their desires would have never been fulfilled. Some recognized that eunuchs were at a disadvantage, but through no fault of their own. Eunuch, which means literally half man, could function as an insult. Whereas some Gentiles equated Jewish circumcision with the form of castration, the Jewish people did not allow eunuchs to enter into the covenant based on Deuteronomy 23, verse 1. The, figura listen, the figurative sense of celibacy in which Jesus means the language would have been less jarring but nonetheless offensive to most of his contemporaries. We'll come back. That marriage is not ultimate is later reinforced in chapter 22, verse 23. That same day, Jesus, that same day, Sadducees came to Jesus, who say there is no resurrection. The Sadducees say that. And they asked him a question saying, teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So too the second and third, and down to the seventh, after them all, the woman died in the resurrection, therefore, of the seven whose wife will she be? Ha, 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 I got you, Jesus. For they all had her. But Jesus answered them, you are wrong, because you do not know the scripture, neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they will neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. D.L. Turner writes, his first he first responds to their argument from Deuteronomy 25 by affirming that people, like angels, do not live as married couples in the afterlife. The Sadducees evidently 
err in assuming that the afterlife will be just like the present life, extrapolating from the present to the future. They also err in not accounting for the power of God to transform human existence. Observations. Being a disciple of Jesus brings division in the family. Amen? It painfully sometimes, painfully divides relationships that we would have otherwise expected to be the most meaningful and long-lasting. But also, being a disciple of Jesus means we are part of a new family. It joyfully brings people together in relationships that we wouldn't otherwise have expected to be in relationship. The unity isn't ultimately biological or marital. The unity is through the person of Jesus. And those united do the will of the Father in heaven. Jesus uses the original male-female, one-flesh union as the prototype and foundation of marriage. Marriage is not a social construct to Jesus. It is a union between a male and a female, that's his argument, that's Jesus' argument, that God together himself joins. Hence the seriousness of divorce. But what should really surprise us here is that Jesus lifts the eunuchs up as an honorable, preferable model. Figuratively speaking, at least, quote, there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. Marriage is not ultimate. The New Testament won't tolerate corruption of God's design for marriage, yet. This is weird. This should weird us out. It also prefers that the citizens of the kingdom remain single and celibate. Marriage, even though in it, God himself joins together a male and a female, is not ultimate and it's not eternal. Those who assume so have no idea what they're talking about, Jesus says. They don't understand the scriptures or the power of God. The new kinds of relationships and intimacies and friendships and families that we will have at the resurrection and are already beginning to have now are beyond our comprehension. They are even better than marriage. And Jesus wants to, us to trust him for that. Next topic, building up to the cross. If one wishes to locate the atonement chiefly in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Gospel of Matthew will not help you make your case. The focal point and the climax of the Gospel of Matthew, for, for the Gospel, for Matthew, of the ministry of Jesus is his death and resurrection. Don't believe me? Listen to this. As the suspense builds, four times Jesus predicts his death. Matthew 16, 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day raised, Matthew 17, 22, as they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. Matthew 20, verse 17. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside and on the way he said to them, see, we're going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified and he will be raised on the third day. In Matthew 21, there's this parable of the tenant farmers in the vineyard verse 38. Jesus, real quickly, Jesus himself in that parable is the son who was killed. In Matthew 23, Jesus rips into the Pharisees. It wasn't very Christ-like of him. <laughs> Associating the Pharisees with a heritage of murdering the prophets. And at the end of chapter 23, Jesus laments, 
Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. And then the fourth time, Matthew 26, verse 1, he says to his disciples, you know that after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in that palace, in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. Then, chapter 26, verse 12, really beautiful story. Jesus is anointed for burial, as it were, by a woman in Bethany, at Bethany. Then Jesus, I'm sorry, then Judas seeks an opportunity to betray Jesus. Then after instituting the Lord's Supper, Jesus foretells Peter's denial. Then Jesus goes into great sorrow and anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he later prays, Father, if it be possible, let this cup. What's the cup? What's the cup that Jesus is about to drink? According to Matthew, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, as I, not as I will, but as you will. Then later again, Father, if this cannot pass, unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving again, he went away and prayed it prayed for a third time, saying the same words over again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand. What hour? The hour he's been foretelling. And the Son of Man is to be, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let's get going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Then Jesus is betrayed by Judas and arrested and interrogated by the high priest and denied by Peter and delivered to Pilate, chosen over Barabbas to be executed, delivered up by Pilate to be crucified, mocked by the soldiers. And on the cross, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Ask yourself, in the Gospel of Matthew, is it building up to the cross? Or is it building up to the garden? If this were a movie script, what would be the climax? Now, something happens on the cross that concerns our final topic, the temple. And we'll come back to bring everything together. Remember quickly with me back in uh, Matthew 12, we talked about how Jesus argues something greater than the temple is here. Now fast, go back to uh, chapter 21, verse 12. Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. Not very Christ-like, is it? And he said to them, I'm just quipping. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Now what's interesting is the Gospel of Matthew doesn't go on to tell us that Jesus says, tear down this temple and I will rebuild it in three days, like the Gospel of John does. But two different times in the Gospel of Matthew, listen, in chapter 26, verse 59, now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. They couldn't find any, though many witnesses had come forward. At last, two came forward and said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. That seemed credible to them. Later in chapter 27, when Jesus is on the cross, he is mocked. You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. In chapter 24, verse 1, going back, Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out the buildings of the temple. Ah, aren't they beautiful? But Jesus answered them, You see all these? Do you not? Truly I say to you, there won't be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Eh, it's all going to burn. Matthew 27, verse 51. Jesus is on the cross, 
being mocked. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth shook and the rocks were split. So this is the conclusion. Three days later, Jesus rises from the dead. This is the Jesus who caused the veil of the temple to tear in two. This is the Jesus who said, something greater than the temple is here. He's greater than the temple and he's greater than the priesthood. This is the Jesus who foretold over and over again the betrayal of his betrayal and crucifixion and resurrection. This is the Jesus who died for me and you. This is the Jesus who sees marriage as a joining together by God of a male and a female into one flesh, yet extols celibate singlehood for the sake of the kingdom, and he who teaches that a new kind of an, a broad family of disciples, this will be a community, a family that outlasts even marriage. This is the Jesus who started his kingdom small like a mustard seed, and he promised to unstoppably continue and build it up until the harvest at the end of the age. This is the Jesus who, with a word, could heal and forgive and stop a storm and cast demons out and give you a new name if you wanted on the spot. No legal paperwork required. With a word. So let me ask you a final question. How did Jesus send out his apostles in the last paragraph of the Gospel of Matthew? How do you think he did it? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.